Now, please, please, let me advise you. As a young man, as a young woman, grow large in your spirit. Grow very large. Give yourself to fasting. Give yourself to prayer now. And I would like to introduce a scripture quickly, which is the book of Luke chapter 18. When we consider the subject of prayer, it is needful for us to understand that there are three steps. There are three layers of prosecuting prayer. You can prosecute prayer having God as your father. All right? Oh my, you're not with me. Okay, because you're not with me, I will shut that down. Let's go back to the scripture. There are, there are three levels in which you can prosecute prayer. The first level is prosecuting prayer, having God as your father. And there are several issues that are associated with that reality. If God gives us permission, tomorrow morning when we come for Bible study, we will look at those aspects. You can prosecute prayer having God as your friend. You can also prosecute prayer having God as a judge. So it is the third aspect of prayer prosecution I want to bring to our notice. And we need to understand that there is a justice system that exists in the realm of the spirit. And this justice system determines uh, the affairs of everything that is a product of God's intentional creation. Are you still with me? Do you still remember what happened in the Garden of Eden? When God was taking Adam on the guided tour through the garden. When they came into the midst of the garden, God told Adam, he said, in the day that you eat of this fruit, the position of the justice system of heaven is that upon your partaking of this fruit, you will die. That's a revelation of the layer of justice that is established in the invincible realm that has jurisdiction and implication in the natural realm. Many believers do not understand that the content of the justice system that is in the invisible realm has great effect on your life in the natural. That was one of the lectures that God was trying to administer to Adam, but he did not listen. He became a victim of that justice system. And because God had scheduled the life of man to, to evolve on the basis of inheritance, every man that came from the loins of adam had his status before god do you understand that until god operating as a lawgiver decided to change the premise of that bondage and to create an outlet for the possibility of salvation when god operates in these three levels what he's trying to work out in your life is salvation okay are you there Luke 18, are you there in Luke 18? And he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So what is the lesson of this parable? The lesson of this parable is that we men, humankind was designed by design we were created as objects of prayer. We were created as beings of priesthood. In fact, by design you ought always to pray according to your design according to the way you were made even though that is not the case with most of us here it means you are not operating according to the script the blueprint of your design this is the design schedule that men ought always to do what to pray and not to faint. second thing i'd like you to notice from this first presentation is that there is nothing like prayerless in the bible have you found the scripture that recognizes the word prayerless because the opposite of prayerful is not prayerless the opposite of a praying man is what is a fainting man you are either praying or fainting men ought always to pray and not to faint and just in case you are fainting you are a victim of circumstances you are a victim of situations so this parable was written in order to teach us another dimension of the prosecution of prayer now so let's let's attend to it and see the scope the layout saying there was in a city a judge which feared not god neither regarded men and there was a widow in that city and she came unto him saying 
avenge me of mine adversary. Please be fast, many people. And he's, he would not for a while, but afterward, he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubled me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge says. This is the lesson, another lesson. And shall not God avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him, though he be along with them let me stop there for now the the scenario here is a scenario of the, of a judge that's the metaphor the crown metaphor in that particular presentation trying to give us an insight into the fact that god is a judge and there are dimensions of prayer that must articulate that status that god sustains in order for us to find the necessary scope of victory that we seek from the hand of God. Is that clear? Second scripture. Before we start the lesson. Second scripture. Meanwhile, the requirement for you, are you here? The require, you know the lesson. The lesson started and the lesson was men ought always to pray and not to faint. Is that the lesson? That's the reason for which the parable was written in the first place. The application of the parable, which is verse 7, it says, shall not God avenge his own elect? That is to say that the metaphor, judge, God satisfies, God operates in the capacity of a judge. It says, shall not God avenge his own elect? What is the requirement for God to avenge on your behalf? According to verse 7. You are not following According to verse 7, what's the requirement? Mm, yeah, you, are, you, you are saying, oh, oh, oh. this is the requirement. This elect that he will avenge, and such as cry day and night unto him. Do you cry day and night? You cry day and night unto him? Then you cannot engage this dimension of God's reality. He will avenge them speedily, the Bible says. Because there are dimensions of prosecuting prayer that you will never enter into and never experience his blessedness if you don't accept the fact that you were designed as a creature of prayer. And part of the benefits that you are going to get operating that way is that because you, you cry day and night, God will be under pressure to avenge you. Now, second scripture, quickly, quickly before I begin the lesson. I want to show you God's, oh my God, we don't have time. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, just to give you an idea, God's courtroom, just to give you an idea of God's courtroom, then I will show you how the politics of justice, judgment, and equity manipulates destiny upon the face of the earth, and why the devil is called an accuser, and what potential, what capacity does the devil have in, in his designation as an accuser. And so you will find out, if you don't fulfill the requirement that I just showed you in verse 7, you will find out that in some legal issues before the Lord, your laxity empowers your enemy. All right, this is the status of God's throne in the sanctuary. I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit. Oh my, I've, I've given you, I'm supposed to read from verse 7, I believe. Then you have a good layout of, um, of, of, uh, yes, okay, 9 and 10. And I beheld the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like, a, like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. And a fiery steam issued forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, and 
the judgment was set and the books was, were opened. This is a scenario, uh, this is a kind of glory that is associated with the justice, judgment, and equity dimension of God that is sustained in the heaven. It is something that you cannot ignore. You cannot ignore those dynamics. And uh, it is not as if it is when people have died and believers have resurrected. That's when the judgment seat will now become operational. Justice, judgment, and equity goes on right now in the sanctuary of God and there's a massive justice system that is established in God's layer. And I want to open your eyes to it in a moment of time. First of all, I may need to take you to the book of Genesis chapter 4, verse 8 to 12. To bring you up to date with the way the proceedings, the proceedings of this court. The proceedings of this court. I need to bring you up to date. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? For the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Give me 11 and leave it there. Because 11 is the judgment that came from that court. I will need to expose you to the proceedings of that court before I show you the kind of judgment that issues from that court. First of all, um, if we were using the Nigerian constitution, there were only two kinds, there are only two kinds recognized witnesses that the Nigerian constitution provides for. The Nigerian constitution provides for either an expert witness or an eyewitness. An eyewitness is someone that was present at the event, the scene of the event. His, his testimony in court can, can tilt uh, the pendulum of justice. An expert witness is somebody like a doctor, pr preferably a doctor of internal medicine that runs an aut autopsy on the dead body. He can bring a testimony to court on the strength of his competence in his profession. And that can also tilt the scales of justice and judgment. But un unfortunately for Cain, because there was no expert witness on ground and there was no eyewitness on ground. So when he was cross-examined, where is Abel, your brother? He thought that it was a court of mortals. And so he answered the way you will answer in a magistrate court in Nigeria. He said, am I my brother's kid? Because if it were a magistrate court, they would not have had anything on him because there is no eyewitness and there is no expert witness. But unfortunately for him, the constitution he was run, it was operating, the court he was operating under had a constitution that could accept the witness of blood. Blood was competent witness in that court. Whereas Cain never knew that blood has an utterance that is so tangible, he can, he can, he can stand in the dock and bring about a witness and place a demand on the justice system that is in that layer. He had no knowledge of that. And the fact that he didn't have knowledge of it did not affect the proceedings. I know many of you here don't believe, don't know that there's a justice system that is established in the layer of God. Today we are going to use that system. You will see in the practical session. That justice system is going to do something here. And uh, you know, in the introductory scripture we used, the Bible reveals that God is our king, God is our judge, God is our lawgiver. And when he sits in either or all of these capacities, what does he come to do? He comes to, to save us. Are you here? In order to clear Cain's doubt that he was not sitting before mortals, the case file was brought. The case file that was left with the registrar of the court was retrieved. And uh, this was the content, verse 11. And now thou art cursed from the earth. Oh. 
with case fire. Now thou art cast from the earth which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood. So what was in the case file was that the blood of Abel, there was a portion of ground that received it. Even that portion of ground. Are you following? He said you are cursed from the earth. Which the curse began from that part of the ground that opened his mouth to receive Abel's blood. Now, this man is not aware of the fact that there are infrastructures in the visible realm that can testify against an individual that is in the dock, in a court of the invincible status. He said, you are cursed from the earth. And the implication of this curse is that there is no territory upon the face of the earth that Cain can establish his destiny. Have you ever seen a seed that there is no ground on earth that you can plant it for it to grow? That was how the destiny of Cain was after the verdict that came from the judge in this case. Cain was going to be a fugitive. He will come to Zangoka Taf and he will try to settle there. If he plants something, the thing will not grow. Anything he tries to establish, no ground on earth will be able to have accept his destiny. So the best he can be is a wanderer. And that status was put in place by a court. Is that clear? Let me give you an idea. Quickly. Because of time. I don't have time. My scripture for the night is 1 Peter 5, verse 8. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 is my scripture. First Peter. There's an activity of Satan that I want us to end this night by reason of, of that court. See, the Bible says be sober. It says be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Can we analyze this scripture a little? The word adversary. I'm interested in the word adversary. Let me look it up quickly. I'm interested in that word. Antidicus. The word antidikos in Greek language is an opponent in a lawsuit. So I'm just trying to bring context and perspective to this scripture. An opponent where? In a lawsuit. Now, so the, the Bible calls the devil, the reason for which we are enjoined to be sober and be vigilant is because you have an opponent in a lawsuit. And this opponent goes around like a roaring lion. It means he uses the instrument, he uses the approach of intimidation. And the reason why he uses the approach of intimidation is so that he can find who among us he can devour. So it means that the roaring lion can transform and become a devouring lion. And the platform that he has to achieve this intention is being an opponent in a lawsuit. Do you get that? Now, when I said that this our adversary he's walking about means he's mobile. He moves from one place to the other. You know, when I said that, most of you felt his movement is only linear. That means he moves from Kaduna to Zaria to Kano. That's not all the possible hope of movement this fella has. This guy can also move into the past. This one. Okay. Um, let me give you a scenario quickly. Um, do you still remember when in the book of Job chapter 1, when the Bible says that a day came when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came with them. Do you remember? 
Now God asked Satan, ah, how has it been? Where are you coming from? He said, I've been walking up and down to and fro the earth. The word walk in that scripture is halak. Halak is the same kind of walk that God was telling Joshua that wherever the sole of your feet shall tread upon, I'm going to give you as a possession. Halak is the walk of priesthood that makes them dominate and take over territory. And he said, that's what I've been doing and I've covered all the earth except the province that Job was established as the warden. It was only his territory I could not halak because you had set up a hedge around him. There is a barricade that you have spiritually enforced around him. So it is impossible for me to halak around Job. <coughs> In this is halakim. He had visited your family too. He had, you, you, you know, when, when the devil was questioned, he did not say, okay, let me check my file. He had Job's data. In real time. And he downloaded evidences. He downloaded intelligence about Job and about his activity. Just in one meeting. The reason is because of his halakin enterprise. In that enterprise he visited your family too. In that enterprise he visited your home. In that enterprise he visited. Do you know. Are you with me? It was in that same encounter that. The accuser now brought a matter. And the accuser said, in my own experience, walking around, Job does not serve you for, any, for nothing. It's because you have put a hedge around him. Meanwhile, this activity he is deploring now is his status as a lion. It's his status as an accuser of the brethren. Are you with me? Where is he accusing them? In the court of heaven. There are activities that take place in the court of heaven that have grievous effects upon you in the natural, in your business, in your workplace, in your family. And those activities are taking place in the court of heaven. Now, you see, what, what I discovered is that believers of this day are totally ignorant of the proceedings of that court. They are just victims of what issues from that court. You see, God's status in that court is 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 the status of justice and i'm going to explain that to you in a moment of time because i need to demand justice for some people here today i know you don't know what justice is but i'm going to demand it for you in the name of jesus and so the devil brought the argument that job was serving him because of this material things that God has given him and if God is sure that Job is not serving him because of material things let him remove the hedge then we'll test him meanwhile it was God himself that advertised Job before Satan Say, since you've been going around did you by any means see Job oh you are not with me I know most of you won't like this kind of advertisement that God should say Bola Bola did you see Bola Satan even forgot Bola, but it was God that recorded. Are you with me? I said, God now accepted because God was sure of his product. Just like when Jesus was raised and he became 30 years and went for baptism under John the Baptist. The next assignment after that public accreditation that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased was to go to the wilderness and be tested of the devil. It's the pathway of sons. When you arrive maturity, one of the things that God does is that he brags before the devil about you and he exposes you to the devil's trials in the court of heaven. I know you don't like trials, but if you don't like trials, you cannot gain rank. You see, there's a difference between anointing and rank. If you keep in the place of prayer and you fast and pray, after a while, you find some anointing. Some divine abilities will be given unto you. But there's something called rank. It is that rank you are going to negotiate. You are going to use to negotiate for a territory. Like a senator. Before God. The way Abraham did. I hope you know Nigeria needs saving. Needs salvation. 
is the job of men of rank. It's, it's to men of rank that God bequeaths territory. Just like for, Ed, for Abraham, God willed the earth to him. Indeed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. If any family is blessed, it is out of the content of the superfluous blessing I made available to Abraham that he found a fraction. It's only to men of stature that God gives territory. It's the way of sons, rank. That's how sons institute and establish the kingdom of God. But in order for you to have that rank, you will have to be tested not by God, you'll be, you'll be tested by the devil. And all of these things are orchestrated within the context of the justice system of heaven, the court of heaven. God was the one that regulated the extent of, of attack that Satan brought to Job. Do you realize that the, the Bible says that even though God is not, he doesn't tempt you with evil. But in every temptation, what does he do? He doesn't allow you to be tempted much more than you can bear. That means God knows your dynamics. He knows your length, your breadth. He knows your tensile strength. He knows your tensile strength capacity. And he will not allow you to be tempted much more than you can bear. And in the midst of the temptation, the Bible says that God, who is the regulator of temptation, will yet create a way of escape. That means if, if you yield in the midst of the pressure, you will find the open window that God allowed in the entire network of pressure. Now, please, please, let me advise you. As a young man, as a young woman, grow large in your spirit. Grow very large. Give yourself to fasting. Give yourself to prayer now.